Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Backlog Busters, where I'm busting out my gaming backlog one video at a time and letting you know if after all these years, these games are worth playing today. In this episode, we're learning that while graffiti is an art, graffiti as an act of vandalism is a crime. In Jet Set Radio! Why am I going back to play Jet Set Radio? Well, after almost an entire year, my analog pocket pre-order finally arrived, and in going back to test a bunch of Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance games, I booted up Jet Grind Radio, and it is... Uh, hard to go back to. So I thought I'd start at the beginning with the original game that this GBA port is based on, which luckily is available on some modern platforms, and see if it holds up any better. Jet Set Radio was released on June 29, 2000 for the Sega Dreamcast in Japan. In North America, it actually had to be renamed to Jet Grind Radio because of some existing trademarks, eventually releasing on October 31st. Europe got the original game with its original name a few months later on November 24th. Jet Set Radio was published by Sega and developed by Smilebit, a development group under Sega that started by developing a Japan-only horse racing derby game, then Jet Set Radio and its sequel, and several other Japan-only sports games with a few notable releases such as Typing of the Dead, Gun Valkyrie, and Panzer Dragoon Orta. Then, due to quite a bit of corporate restructuring inside of Sega throughout the years, the smile bit distinction was lost, fading into far more generic sounding development divisions within Sega. Smilebit was home to several developers who worked on the Panzer Dragoon series for the Sega Saturn. They wanted to take a break from their previous fantasy games and create something more unique that had pop culture in it, as there weren't many games like that at the time. Jet Set Radio received near universal praise, sitting at a 94 on Metacritic at the time of its release, with reviews such as IGN saying it is without a doubt the biggest breath of fresh air to sweep through gaming in a good long while, and no Dreamcast owner's library would be complete without it. And GameStop saying, a game full of redefinitions, forcing you to really rethink what you expect out of a game from an audio-visual standpoint, while delivering some exciting, balanced gameplay at the same time. Jet Set Radio also racked up several awards from publications at the time, like an Excellence in Visual Arts Award and a Game Spotlights Award from the Game Developer's Choice Awards of the time. A sequel, Jet Set Radio Future, was released on the original Xbox two years later in 2002, which was one of the main reasons that I bought an Xbox console, because I played this at a friend's house and was so impressed. That sequel was followed by a very faithful port to the Game Boy Advance, which I picked up on day one because it had been developed by Vicarious Visions, and they were quite talented at converting skating games for the platform at the time because they did the ports of the Tony Hawk Pro Skater to the Game Boy Advance. It was kind of hard to go back to play both of these while capturing the footage, but having a way to play any of the Pro Skater or Jet Set games portably at the time was amazing. Luckily, they were both rated E for everyone, not the hardcore T for Teen rating of the home console versions that were too much for my developing mind. But let's talk about the first game, Jet Set Radio, and see if it lives up to the praise it received at the time of its release. It's extremely hard to narrow down what stands out most about Jet Set Radio, the music is super unique and fits the world extremely well, the animations are emotive, and the story is weird and wacky. But if I had to choose just one thing, it would have to be the visual style. It makes the most strong and lasting impression when you first boot up the game. Ever since seeing the revealed trailer to The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, I've been enamored by games that have cell shaded visuals, and Jet Set Radio came out two years before that. But I guess I just missed out on that game, as I never knew anyone who had a Dreamcast, and I only ever played the first level of Sonic Adventure at a Toys R Us demo kiosk for the Dreamcast. Starting Jet Set Radio, I immediately fell in love with the vibrant city filled with neon colors and sharp angles. I will admit I've got a huge amount of nostalgia for these flat, pixelated textures on a low-poly world, because it reminds me of the Mega Man Legends series a little bit, but just more detailed, bright, and striking. The characters here are unlike any others I've seen. Their future street style, huge skates with only two wheels for some reason, they almost glow in neon, which really helps them stand out from the environment around them. And they just cannot stand still as much as they try. They have to move and dance constantly, which with the soundtrack this good, who can blame them? Then you've got another level of authenticity and uniqueness as the graffiti featured in this game was designed by real graffiti artists of the time. It's a wholly unique look, and the only other game I know that even comes close to this is the sequel, which came out two years later on the original Xbox. Most of the story in this game is told through DJ Professor K's broadcasts, in between levels that are accompanied by these unique comic panels that scroll by, just in case you ever doubt this game is just overflowing with style. 
Things start off slow, with your gang, the GGs, fighting over territory with the different gangs of the city. All these gangs sport unique, vision-obstructing outfits that seem less than ideal for skating around busy streets, as the noise tanks wear tiny peripheral vision blocking goggles, Poison Jam features tiny eye holes cut in a Batman-like cowl, and the Love Shockers all have eye injuries limiting their depth perception. You'll start out tagging each other's spots to control territory in the early game, then taking them out by just tagging their clothes, which everyone knows you cannot recover from, so time to hang up the skates. It ain't no sequels in the works for these monsters. Each gang you take down reveals a piece of the puzzle as to what the corporation that controls the city is up to. That corporation, the Rakuku Group, starts to launch a literal army to stop you from discovering the truth and to prevent your rampant spray painting. You'll start by tagging signs, buses, and more while dodging cops, as things quickly escalate to use spray painting helicopter windshields until they spiral out of control, crashing into the ground, and just lay there as smoldering wreckage until you finish the level. But they did fire literal rockets at these kids on rollerblades, so I guess we're even? There are technically only three levels in this game, but most of them include three to four large, unique zones inside of them. Each of these zones has its own unique look and obstacles, with early missions just taking place in one zone, then later levels having you travel between all the zones in a given level. It took me a while to realize that all these zones were connected, and while there is a map, it doesn't do the best job at telling you how they're connected, with no way to view the overall map of the level, just individual maps of each zone. So while the map is helpful for locating objectives, there's definitely room for improvement here. All the levels have a different feel, as do the individual zones. For instance, the Shibuya Cho level's first zone takes place at a bus stop, with cars and people milling all about, as well as some strange, fake, wily coyote walls that you skate directly into, even though every fiber of my brain told me, this is wrong. This is where they test out a weird, fixed camera angle that's very disorienting. It feels like how in 3D Sonic games you hold forward and the camera swoops all around to look cool, but there are two exits here, and I regularly had to check my map to figure out where I was in this 3D space when being viewed from a fixed angle with 2D artwork all around me. It's just strange. Next, you've got an extremely dangerous combo of an under construction bridge, over a playground that's sandwiched between a huge storm drain and a busy street. Then a downhill zone that's super fun to speed down, just slow and boring to skate up. Luckily, you can hitch a ride on traveling cars to pull yourself uphill quickly. In most cases, it felt like the areas were really well laid out for the abilities that you have in this game. Some of the layouts can be a bit of a mess, with rails just a little bit too close together that make it hard to land on the one that I wanted, but plenty of areas felt laid out in a way to encourage huge combos, like the bus station, which perfectly loops once you get a handle on the controls. Any skater you choose in this game comes equipped with magnet skates, and there's no need to worry about a balance meter or anything other than just trying to keep your speed up. But if you come into the game expecting Tony Hawk, as I did, you will most likely struggle for a bit. I don't think that's a negative in any way. I'm just fighting years of Tony Hawk muscle memory that maybe most people don't struggle with, but I do think the game could do a better job at explaining the intricacies of this game. Each character has different stats that affect their health, skating skill, how many spray paint cans they can hold, and their graffiti ability, which confusingly makes the tagging minigame actually harder the higher their graffiti skill is. But they all have the same floaty jump, magnet boots for grinding, a wall ride that you can chain consecutively to gain height, and a boost that doesn't really increase your speed all that much, as well as the ability to spray paint. You'll have to use all these moves together to escape the Rokuko group and tag specific points. You'll need to pick up spray cans around the environment and then tag the marked areas. Red arrows are required spots and green ones are optional. And all the arrows show up on your map, so you'll need to worry more about how to get close enough to tag them and less about where in the environment they are. Tagging small areas just requires a pull of the trigger, while tagging medium or large areas will require you to quickly pull and twist your stick in different ways to finish the design. Failing one of these prompts will restart the prompt order but they let you continue from where you left off on the design itself. Doing these without error just seems to net you more points and finishes them more quickly. There are some other objective types in the game which pop up, with my favorite being basically a game of horse, where you have to pull off the exact move shown to you, and missing one single jump ends your run, with your skater dramatically falling to their knees in defeat. But restarting is quick and easy. 
I wish there were more of these objectives to teach you good combos, skills, and ways to navigate the environment, but they are few and far between. I really liked that most of the levels and objectives felt more like platforming navigation puzzles that require you to pull off combos of jumps, grinds, and more to get close to a tagging point or complete a challenge. Now, there are some complaints I have about the controls that I do not think aged well. I had a ton of trouble in the first couple levels, and I'm not sure how much was down to my Tony Hawk memory and how much was the game just not filling me in on what I had to do. So after a few frustrating levels, I went and tried the optional tutorial back out in the main menu, which does point out some more helpful things like jumping while dashing lets you jump further, or how jumping while grinding increases your speed which are very helpful for the lengths of some jumps both in and out of this tutorial. So here's what I came to understand, but I could still be misinterpreting some things because again, the game wasn't super clear. Jumping the second you land on a rail seems to do a trick, increasing your speed. So you kind of want to keep hopping if you can. Hitting a rail straight on does not cause you to crash because the magnet boots attach and you're fine to just keep grinding. Though you may want to tilt the stick a little bit in the direction you'd like to go so you don't end up grinding to the left when you meant to go to the right. Combos increase while just grinding and not jumping at all. So in the tutorial when it asks you to do 20 tricks, you can get a majority of those tricks on one single rail. No need to really jump unless your rail is too short. And much like when grinding, you can increase your speed and do a trick when you jump off a wall ride the second you land on the wall. Doing the tutorial helped me learn some of these things, but I also had to look up some walkthroughs and videos to complete the tutorial because of two things. One lesson asks you to push forward, then backwards while dashing to do a turnaround. Then another lesson asks you to jump while you do a turnaround to twist in the air. Which I spent 10 plus minutes trying over and over with no luck whatsoever. And it turns out you don't have to be moving or dashing at all. You can just stand still, push forward, then backwards, and jump. That's it. Contrary to the instructions just given to you on the turnaround insisting it had to be done while dashing. Then the last challenge of the tutorial requires you to get a 50 trick combo. And no matter what I did, I could not figure out how to keep a chain going that long. But I found some videos that explained the perfect loop, just cycling clockwise around these rails. This in no way should have been a required step in the tutorial without some highlights or just tips on how the mechanics of speed work in this game. This felt like going for a really hard achievement, but the game hasn't given you nearly enough practice, guidance, or instructions to be able to reasonably pull this off in the tutorial. Now, I'm a huge fan of the Pro Skater games, Ollie Ollie, and other similar games that require repeated attempts to nail the perfect trick, combo, or line. But the fact that this game doesn't really teach you its most important mechanics as far as I could tell was really frustrating. Although I will say I was much better at the game after doing the tutorial and finally grasping these mechanics. So hopefully at the very least this video helps some people more easily get past the walls that I hit in the game. Time is a really big concern in this game, especially in the races that come up when you're challenged by someone wanting to join your gang. Not really clear on the rationale behind challenging the gang leader to see if that leader is worthy of letting you join. It seems like they should actually be judged by the gang leader themselves, but I found these races to be extremely difficult and was never able to beat any of these on the first or second try, instead taking several more attempts to beat. As with some of the lessons in the tutorial, I just didn't feel like the game prepared you for this, as 90% of the game is go tag X number of spots in the time limit. So you might have learned the layout of these levels and their individual zones, but the races require complete mastery of a very specific route, which is a cool idea, but I just felt very unequipped at swapping out my platforming and navigational skills to then focus completely on speeding down a specific path. The levels don't feel built for racing in some places, with things like the fiddly ramps that I never got the hang of. or narrow hallways just not feeling great to navigate. 
your opponent will wait for you at certain points in the race, which made it seem like they would maybe take it easy on you or ramp up the difficulty, but in the last portion of the race, they don't hold back and you'll be bumping into them barely able to eke out a win. The police force in this game is ruthless, as they send out large groups, use tear gas, just shoot pistols at you, send dogs, and use full-blown attack choppers against you. You can escape to higher ground, and some tips I read mentioned clearing the ground floor objectives first before the whole army arrives. But once they're here, there's no easy way to deal with them. Sure, you can knock over the captain and spray him, but it felt inconsistent, and it doesn't last very long. Taking out choppers works fine, but some levels are shorter than others and kind of leave them out of reach. I just wish there was a more consistent way to deal with them by spraying or knocking them over as they just blocked and threw off my tricks or tagging more and more as the levels went on. Along the same lines, some missions have you basically play tag against the other gangs, where you need to tag their backs, but I really struggled to make the controls work for this. You need to be directly behind them and very, very close. The boost button doesn't really speed you up that much, and the radius in which you can spray is too small, and this was just frustrating to do, with no way to slow them down or knock them over or do anything to make it easy to get close and spray. On top of this, the spray button recenters the camera every time you press it, which just leads to a kind of disorienting camera movement while you try to spray them all. Dealing with, I guess, what amounts to enemies in this game just felt clunky to me. Now, with all that in mind, how did I feel about this game overall, and would I recommend Jet Set Radio as a game that should be on your backlog? On the good side, the game looks incredible in motion and sounds great. The way the story is told through the pirate radio and the wacky events that take place in Tokyo 2 is really fun to watch, with interesting levels that feature good uses for your jet skates and really feel good to move around in most cases. The main tagging missions that have you exploring, platforming, and spraying are really, really fun and were more than enough to keep me playing through the entire game. On the bad side though, the controls take quite a bit of time to get used to, with the game itself not really assisting that much, or at least that's how it felt to me. Also, having to wrestle with the controls to race, deal with the police, and play tag just didn't feel nearly as fun or polished to me as the main tagging missions that you do. This all comes down to form a recommendation of maybe. If you're willing to get over the learning curve of controls and deal with some frustrating objectives from time to time, there's a lot to like here, and it gave me the same type of challenges that I love in the pro skater and other skating games, which admittedly does involve a lot of retrying until you nail the perfect trick or combo or line, but you'll feel extremely accomplished once you pull it off. I just wish there was a smoother ramp of objectives and missions that lead up to these challenges so that you could feel more prepared to tackle them, as well as some tweaks to how you're able to deal with other characters and enemies in the game. And I'll throw out my normal message that my opinion on this game is not meant to tarnish any fond memories you have of playing this. And if you loved or still love this game, please tell me why in the comments below. I'd love to hear about your experience and talk about the parts that I also really liked. If you're interested in playing this game, there are several options available. You can play the original game if you want to pick it up on the Dreamcast. But luckily there are a few modern options. As in 2012, Sega released an HD port on PC, PS3, PS Vita, and Xbox 360. The PC version is readily available on Steam. The PS3 and PS Vita versions are all still available, but those stores are kind of teetering on a cliff of possibly shutting down any day now, as they have once before, and we can't be sure that Sony won't suddenly pull the plug again. Then there's the Xbox 360 release, which is also backwards compatible with any Xbox One or Xbox Series consoles. But that's it for this episode of Backlog Busters. Have you played Jet Set Radio? What do you think? Is it a must-play game in your opinion? Does it deserve to be on others' backlogs? Let me know in the comments below, I'd love to talk more about it. Also, let me know if you have any suggestions for what game you think I should clear off my backlog next, and I'll work to make a video on it. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the little thumbs up button and subscribe, it helps a lot. And if you want to get alerted whenever I get done editing my next video, don't forget to hit the bell icon. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and see you in the next video. Bye.